When we read the New Testament, we see over and over that there are calls for believers to stand firm in the faith. They're called not only to stand strong against the pressures in the world that might cause their faith to weaken, but we see that they're also called to stand firm against what comes up against them in the church. As we've seen in our journeys through the several short New Testament books that we've been in over the last year, the problems that we saw the Apostle Paul addressing were not just pressures from the outside world. It was false doctrine within the church. And in Colossians, just a few weeks back, we we saw that the people were teaching that, sure, you, you need Jesus to forgive your sins, but they were also saying that that wasn't enough. Yeah, your sins are forgiven, but you, you need more. After that, you needed some spiritual experience or some feast to have a ba- better increase in faith. Maybe it was a religious ritual or some other experience. This wasn't the world coming at their faith. It was false teachers within the church who were questioning the sufficiency of Christ. And just recently we saw in the book of Titus that people in the church were teaching false doctrine. And what was Titus supposed to do? He was supposed to stand strong. And he was to continue and to proclaim the truth of the gospel. And so today for you Sunday, we have another passage that has the Apostle Paul telling someone in the church to stand strong in the faith. Timothy's a young man, and this is why we've landed in this passage today. And now we focus today on our young people, but what Paul instructs Timothy in is vital and important for each and every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. In this passage, we see three distinct things that we're going to take away from it this morning. And the first is that training in godliness is of infinite value. We know that what we learn about sound doctrine and what we do for the sake of the gospel is something that will last. It not only endures through the trials and hardships of this life, but it also has eternal value. And secondly, we see that these are the things that we're to proclaim. These are the things that we're to live. After letting Timothy know the value of what he's been taught, he makes sure that he understands that he doesn't keep this message to himself. He also lets him know that it starts with how he lives. There's not to be a disconnect between how we live and what we do. And lastly, we see that we must be certain to stand strong in these things. Paul says that we are to persist, that we're to stand fast. You see, there's no fast track. There's no easy path to living the Christian life. We must persevere and be deliberate to take a look at how we live as we make sure that what we say we believe lines up with how our lives are actually lived in the real world. And so with that framework laid out for us, we we land in the fourth chapter of 1 Timothy, and we see our first point very clearly, that training in godliness is of infinite value. As this passage starts out, we find that Paul is referring to things that Timothy's to put before his fellow brothers. Just just prior to this, in this part of Timothy, because we haven't been working our way through the book, we see Paul letting his young friend know that in later times... Some people will depart from the faith. He says that they'll devote themselves to deceitful spirits, that they'll devote themselves to the teaching of demons, and they'll make rules out of things for their own gain, and they'll use strange teachings to control people, to lead people astray. And so what we see this morning is what Timothy's supposed to do in order to show those around them how they're actually supposed to live how they're actually supposed to live this faith out. And so Timothy's been trained in the faith, and now he is going to go out and do it. And he's going to live a life that is in contrast to all the false teachers that are out there and to show those who cling to the faith, once for all delivered to the saints, how they are to live. Now the first thing we see here in this passage that they're to avoid is irreverent, silly myths. Now we're not 100% certain uh, 
what he was talking about with this. But in this time, there were superstitious stories that were from non-biblical Jewish writings that people were trying to mix in with, with the Christian faith. And while we may not have the same things going on now, we are still vulnerable to this. We all look for some sort of affirmation that, that what we believe is true. We want something, some story that will say, yeah, my faith is the right thing. And so we can latch on to superstitions or anecdotal stories and we can put more trust in that experience or that story from someone more than we put our faith and our trust in the inspired, inerrant Word of God. Now, with the risk of, risk of embarrassing myself, I'm actually going to tell a story of, of when I did just this. I, I was pretty young. Uh, I was in high school when the first Gulf War was going on, and I heard a story secondhand about how someone I knew from the church that I went to youth group at with a friend in Sioux Falls, uh, his sister had a special experience. Uh, she went to school at SDSU, and one Sunday after church, she was heading back up to Brookings, and somehow she ended up picking up someone on the side of the road, the story went. And this person started talking about Saddam Hussein. And he told this, this sister of this friend of mine that the end was near. Obviously, it wasn't very near because it's 2020, right? That was 27 years ago. Uh, he gave some details of what was going to happen in the very near future. And I don't remember exactly how the story went, because good grief, it was nearly 30 years ago. The details are foggy. But I do remember the last part of this story. They said that the person sitting in the passenger seat of her car disappeared into thin air while she was going down the road at 70 or 75 miles an hour on I-29. Now, as silly as this seems now, as a young person, what I did was I latched on to that. I was concerned about a pretty serious conflict in the Middle East, and I put a lot of faith in that story. It, it confirmed to me that what I believed about God was in fact true. That was my evidence for why I believed what I believed. I put my trust in some silly little myth instead of the inerrant, inspired, and revealed word of Almighty God. And like I said, I'm sort of embarrassed to admit it, but, but at the same time, that has shaped me. That has actually formed me in an important way. Now I want to know the Word of God, and I came to understand I don't need, I don't need stories, but that the revealed Word of God is not only true, but it's sufficient. I don't need add-ons to the Bible to know it has authority, to think that it will grow me in holiness. It actually will. The revealed, inspired, and inerrant Word of God is enough. It really is. And that's what's important, to trust the revealed Word of God. That's, not what, that, that's what we're to be trained in. Not myths, not sentimental ideas, not even what someone is telling us that God supposedly told them. Paul says that we are to be trained in godliness, and we do that by knowing the Word of God. And Paul uses a great little illustration for us to help us understand this, doesn't he? Because he refers to the idea of training our body. And some of us are good at that, and some of us aren't. Some of us aren't. But we understand the illustration, right? He says that training the body is of some value, but godliness is valuable in every way. It not only prepares you for the life to come, but it also prepares you for this life. Godliness will help you to live in peace with your neighbors. It will equip you to live in the real world. It will equip you to care for others. And Paul is deliberate about this idea. He says that this is a trustworthy statement. It deserves full acceptance. In other words, what he's saying is, Timothy, this is important. Train yourself in godliness. Christian, this is important. Train yourself in godliness. It needs to be a priority. And he tells us why 
We have put our hope in the living God, who's our Savior. And so we want to grow in that trust. We want to desire the godliness and holiness that he blesses us with through the Holy Spirit. That's to be our longing and our striving. And so in this first part of today's passage, we've seen that our training in godliness is of infinite value. And that we are to make this spiritual training, this this discipline, a priority for our lives. And so as we move on to our next block of text in this passage, we see that those things that we're to value are not to be kept to ourselves, but instead they're to be proclaimed so that people will hear that these things are the commands of God. We see in this next part of the passage that this truth is very clear. He says, command and teach these things. This idea that we as believers are to focus on spiritual training isn't a suggestion. This is to be something that we add to the, this isn't just something that we add to the mix when we can find the time. This isn't just something like going to the gym in January and getting in shape for the rest of the year, right? No, this is to be an all the time thing. Paul tells Timothy to command them because it's that important. Our spiritual development is not a suggestion that is to fall in behind our exercise routines in priority or our professional development in our priorities. Those kind of things are important, but they're temporary. And, but we're to focus on that which will truly last. And that's why he uses the word command here. He isn't supposed to just float this out there as one of the buffet options for how we're to fill our lives. For believers, this is the main course. It isn't a side dish or something we have a little sample of to see if we like it. It's to be our nourishment. It is the meat of our Christian life. But Paul is obviously concerned that Timothy will be silent or that he'll, he will allow his teaching to be ignored because Timothy might be looked down upon because he's younger. Now, we're having youth Sunday here today, and that's the reason we're in this passage. But it's unlikely that Timothy was in his teenage years. Uh, In their culture, you were considered a youth. You're going to like this. You were considered a youth until you were 40. Yeah. Diane and Mark, how would you like to have to have a bunch of 35-year-olds to take care of? Maybe easier, but they probably wouldn't like the games as much. But anyway, uh, regardless... The idea of what Paul is saying holds true for our young people and for all of us. This isn't Paul saying that just because you're young, just because you're younger and have a different perspective, you should tell others how it's done. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying because you're young, boss them around. His focus here is to say, Timothy, I've given you the truth, so proclaim it. You've got a message to stand upon. So proclaim that message. He's not telling Timothy that he should just throw his own ideas out there and see if they stick because you're a youth, you you understand how the world is. No, Timothy is to proclaim things that Scripture tells us. It's not Timothy's own ideas. And that's an important thing for all of us, and particularly our young people, to understand. Get to know Scripture. Focus on what God has to say. And that's how you can challenge not only the people in your age group, but even those that are older. Now young and even the older are thinking, that's great. I can get on board with that, but but people will look down on me. That's what Paul's concern was, was that he'd see people looking down on Timothy, or Timothy would see them looking down on him, and he he would be silent. Maybe it's because we believe that it's because we're young, or maybe because we think that the world doesn't have much time for the Word of God. But this is why Timothy is told to set an example. He's supposed to set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Basically, to sum up what Paul's saying, he's saying, carry yourself in such a way that people will know that you actually believe what you're saying. You aren't saying ideas that you don't personally take to heart. If you have clean and honoring speech, If you show yourself to love and have good conduct and you're pure, people are going to notice. You'll stand out. I can guarantee it. You'll stand out. The other morning, uh, I woke up 
ridiculously early. I uh, couldn't get back to sleep. I didn't feel well. And so I sat down in my recliner. I pulled out my laptop, and I started working on this very sermon right here. And uh, after working for a while, I wanted to have something else going on in the room just to remind me I wasn't alone in the world. And so I decided to see what was on TV, and I was looking for something specific. I actually came across a golf tournament on the Golf Channel, and it, it was a European tour event being played in Saudi Arabia. That was exactly the kind of thing I was looking for. I wanted to turn it down, just have no, something, nothing this in the background, but it just made me feel like I, I wasn't necessarily alone in the house. You know, one of those mental blocks you can have when you're trying to be productive. And uh, at 4.45 in the morning, I around there, I looked up, and they had that traditional blimp view of the golf course. You know what I'm talking about. They started, zoomed in on a fairway and a green, and they zoomed out, and they zoomed out, and they got to this broader view, and the greens and the fairways were lustrous. They were green, but they were in Saudi Arabia. Everything else was, was brown and sandy. Even the houses were all brown and earth tones. The golf course couldn't be missed because it was an oasis of green, lush stuff. I wonder how much uh, dirt they had to haul in to grow that grass. I wonder how much water it takes for them to keep it looking like that. It stood out. It was amazing. The contrast between the golf course and everything around it in that plain, brown world. And if we as Christians set an example in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, we will stand out like that golf course because we will be light in a dark world. And speaking specifically to our young people, you will stand out in this world if you stand up for Christ and his gospel. Do you want to be different? Do you want to stand out? Living a life of purity in your world will stand out. And it'll give you an opportunity to share the gospel. Living a life of truly caring about others, not just saying you care for others, it will stand out in the world. Having clean speech will make others see that you actually believe what you say you believe. And while I've diverted for a moment to the youth among us, this is true for each and every one of us, right? We're called to have our lives stand out and be a contrast to the world, that we might have a powerful witness, that we might have effective witness. We're called to live this way and be equipped in the faith and to be trained in godliness. And before we move on to our final point here, we, we see a few things that Timothy is called to devote himself, and I want to point those out. The first one is the public reading of Scripture. He's to put the words out there to be heard. And this makes sense, right, to, to do this? Because if we actually believe that God uses the word and that the Holy Spirit will build us up in faith and godliness, then we want plenty of Scripture to be heard. And so Paul charges Timothy to read Scripture to the believers whenever they gather together. And then we see the word exhort, and it, that's not a word we use very often. It means to encourage to urge others on to believe and live in a godly way. And we see that this is probably what Timothy was seen to have been gifted with by God because the elders laid their hands on him and they made a proclamation. The word used here says prophecy, but that word doesn't always mean a telling of the future. It may have been, but that word also means a proclamation of the truth that comes from God. And so Timothy was charged with the elders when he saw when they saw this gift of that Timothy had to proclaim the word and so Paul is telling him develop that gift get better at it he's to practice it and make progress in it and so this brings us to the final verse of our passage today and to our final point we we first saw today that we're to train in godliness and to grow in godliness then the charge on us was to not only proclaim God's truth but to live a life consistent with that truth, right? And so now in this final verse for us today, we're to stand strong and firm in these things. And to do that, Timothy is to keep a close watch on himself. 
Paul wants Timothy to make sure that he does what he is doing and he keeps his teaching on track. He doesn't want Timothy being creative, coming up with new teachings on his own. That's the problem in the church. That's what the false teachers are doing. So he's telling Timothy to stand firm. He wants him to be certain that what he's teaching is in line with what he's been taught. And as we saw a few weeks back in the book of Titus, we hold fast to the truth of Scripture and the gospel because we want to make sure that we get the message right. We don't do this because we want to win arguments or because we like to be right. We make sure that we get the message of the gospel right because we love each other. We love each other. We love others. And we also do it because it's true. It's true. It's true that we are all sinners who needed to be rescued. It's true that God the Son took on human flesh and lived among us. It is absolutely true that even though Jesus was without sin, he took on the wrath of God for my sin and yours in his death on the cross. It's true that that same crucified Lord defeated sin, death, and hell when he rose victorious over the grave. And it's true that you and I are saved not by the works that we do, but instead by faith in what Jesus has done for us. And all of that, every bit of that, is as true as the fact that you are sitting where you're at today. The gospel is true. And it's that very message that God the Holy Spirit uses in us to create faith in our hearts, to build us up in faith. And if all of that's true, and it is, then we keep close watch on what we believe, on what we teach. We keep close watch on how we live. And it says here that by persisting in doing this, he saves himself and his hearers. Now remember, Scripture is very clear that we don't save ourselves by our own works. And so Paul isn't telling Timothy to get to work on doing all this stuff because you need to earn heaven points for people so they can get saved. That, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that this stuff is true, Timothy. And so when you, when you hold fast to it, when you keep yourself in the faith, people will hear it and they'll believe and others will be bought, brought to faith. Like I said, it's not a point system that Timothy can use to go out and get folks saved. It's a statement on the importance of proclaiming the gospel. And that is what we come to the end of our 10 verses with this morning in 1 Timothy 4. We, we've seen the three clear points from the text, but how do we then take it from here and use it in our world. There's two things that I want to challenge us with today to apply it to our lives. The first is that we need to be deliberate to train ourselves in the faith. So the challenge is be deliberate to train yourself in godliness this week. We've just seen how important this is and that it's of eternal value. And there's several things that this could be for you. Maybe it's picking up your Bible a little extra this week. Maybe it's taking a minute or two before you start your school day or before you start your day at work with prayer. Maybe it's grabbing hold of a verse or two and committing it to memory this week. I was actually very convicted about Scripture memory from an odd source this week. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with the uh, Christian satire site, the Babylon Bee. They write satirical articles to make a point. And a lot of them are really convicting. And just this week, I saw an interesting fake headline on their website. It said this, local man has more Napoleon Dynamite quotes memorized than Bible verses. And the idea was that we often care more about quoting random movies than quoting scripture. Now that alone, that alone is a gut punch. But then this satire article uh, as I read into it, had a quote from this fictitious movie-quoting man. And this is what it said. I like to store up lines from Napoleon Dynamite in my heart. So I always have a good one for any situation that might come my way. Now, they did that on purpose. You know, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Well, he used it, they used that here on purpose because they wanted to convict us of this. This is piercing satire, because it convicts us that we need to be more deliberate to train ourselves in godliness. 
Immersing ourselves in Scripture is how we do this. And so find something this week, whether, whether it's prayer, Bible reading, family worship, memorizing a piece of Scripture. But I want to challenge you to be deliberate this week with it. Throw yourself into it and trust that God the Holy Spirit will be at work and that he will bless it because that's what he promises to do. He blesses the proclamation of the word. And secondly, think about how the world around you looks and how you personally can stand out for Christ in that world. Like that golf course I talked about. How can you be the green oasis in a dark world? Timothy was called out to stand out in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. And those are the, that's the call on our lives. And in some way, I'm sure that we stand out as believers. But this week, I want to challenge us to pick one of those things and focus on how you can stand out for Christ in that area this week. Now, I'm not meaning to be lax in the other areas, obviously. Uh, but instead, think about how there's a specific area of your life that can be used for his glory as an opportunity to proclaim the gospel where you are at. And so as we depart from here this week, may you be blessed as you are called to be a good servant of, Je of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel we proclaim is true. And so may we be diligent to find ways that we can proclaim it. Just as Paul called Timothy to persist in. May we be strengthened, young and old, by the word and by his spirit, that we might serve our gracious Savior. Amen.